So, prayer is simple, is it not? Prayer is simple, but it's not easy. It's very simple, but it's not easy. For about eight years before I moved downtown, I had the honor and privilege, actually with Kelly and a number of other folks, to facilitate the new member class. And um, how I got people on time was to say, if you're the last one there, you have to do the ending prayer and the opening prayer the next week. Everybody came on time because they didn't want to pray out loud. And so for some people, praying out loud can be very intimidating, you know? Apparently for the religious, it wasn't because they wanted to be seen praying out loud. But for some of us, it, it, it produces a time of angst, um, kind of discomfort to pray in front of other people. And I think that has to do with, you know, wanting to do it right or they're not as uh, spiritual as the super Christians that we perceive, you know, Praying out loud, what am I going to say? Is it the right thing? So that's one way that people kind of feel uncomfortable with prayer. Now, praying in a group is one thing, but how about praying alone? How many of you have experienced any obstacles with that? Okay, for those of you that have your hands up, I want to hear from you in just a minute. For those of you who don't see me after, because I want to talk to you and learn, because I think all of us, if we spend a little bit of time by ourselves praying, we do something like this. Dear God, I'm praying for Christmas and his, uh, please be with him and his wife and strengthen their family and I can't wait to what I'm going to have for lunch. <laughs> Did I remember to lock the door? It's cold in here. How many of you ever have that happen? You'd be praying for someone, and yet your mind starts to go, right? And so, yes. Yeah, like, so then those thoughts kind of sneak, sneak in and say, like, is this even doing anything? Is it, like, or you have this one. Hey, I'll be praying for you, Chris. And then you see him on Sunday, and you realize you haven't prayed for him. And then you're like, oh, God, please be with him. Please be with him. Hey, Chris, it's, it, I've been praying for you, buddy. It's good, good job, man. Good job. Good job, right? Oh. Um, None of you do that. So we're in this, this journey uh, called Ashes to Action. And when I came to uh, worshiping community, I didn't really, I didn't know all the churchy stuff. So let me just tell you, for, if there's anybody in here that doesn't understand this, that's okay. So Lent starts with Ash Wednesday. It's Wednesday. It runs for 40 days, not including Sundays, towards Easter. Okay, and in our sermon series uh, now, we're, we're talking about ashes to action, like this movement and, and the five marks of a Methodist written by Steve Harper, who was here a few weeks ago. And so I, uh, Debbie highlighted, but I just want to say it again. So the first mark is to love God. People will know we are Christians by our love, says John, and love God. The second is to rejoice in God. And then last week we talked about giving thanks in all circumstances, Good, bad, challenging. And so that's where we are. And today we have the nice tall order of praying always. Anybody do that? Praying always. That's a, that's a tall order. So our scripture today comes from Matthew uh, that uh, Kelly read. And it's from the Sermon on the Mount. And so some of you know, I just got back from the Holy Land, so I want to share some of those. And that's a picture. So this is where tradition says that Jesus delivered the Sermon on the Mount. Whether it's true or not, they don't know for sure. But so here's a couple of pictures. You can see that back there. That's the Sea of Galilee. So we got to ride on the Sea of Galilee and like go to Bethsaida and Capernaum and all these places where he was. And this is where they said the Sermon on the Mount. Can you go to one? I think there's one more. Um, this was the view, so I got to do silent prayer for like 10 minutes overlooking the Sea of Galilee. It was the most coolest, powerful thing uh, ever. So in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is talking to whom? Anybody know? In, in the, at least in Matthew, it starts in chapter 5. Who is he talking to? Did you just have your voice up? Oh, yeah, Josh, all right. He put his hand up. He was actually just un, un, taking his arm around somebody. Do you know who they're talking to? Do you want to share? Risk? Okay. Who else? He was talking about God. That's good. Who's he talking to? Anybody? 
I'll, I'll talk in all. Okay, so sorry to torture you. Usually it's three different groups. When you see Jesus talking, you can, you can look at three different groups. He often talks to the religious leaders. That's a group he talks to. Number two, he talks to the crowds. And then the third, he talks to the disciples. And so, and, and he probably gave the sermon over and over again, so they all probably experienced it. But the scripture here says that he's talking to the disciples. So to me, that's a little bit of a higher level teaching that he's, that he's talking. He's talking to the disciples. And so the scripture says that he lambastes, really, the religious leaders. He's saying that they want to be seen, that they, don't, they aren't even aware of their unconscious motivation to want to be seen uh, holy by men. And what was interesting to me is that he said that they, God knows, God knows what we ask before we even ask it. God knows what we need. God knows you. God knows me. God knows us. So Jesus kind of puts the religious leaders in their place, and then um, he goes after the Gentiles, apparently, and says that they believe that they'll be here heard by their many words. And so, you know, some of the most effective prayers I've found in my life, and I don't know if this is true for you, are the really short ones. Help, be with me, take it away. I can remember when I first uh, kind of started uh, exploring Jesus again, I kind of had a lot of bad things, what I perceived to be at the time, bad things going on. And all I could muster was help, thank you. Those were my two. I'd do them on my knees. In the morning, I'd say, help me. And at the end of the day, I'd get on my knees and I'd say, thank you. And those are really effective prayers. And for those of you that aren't like in a, in a real rhythm of, of sharing um, with God and connecting with God in that way, I just, I just encourage you to wake up and say, God, thank you for the day. Help me. Help me be of service to others. And at the end of the day, say thank you. And that could begin a, a regular rhythm, uh, moving from ashes to action. So, um, Evagrius, who is a, I don't know if well-known is the right thing, but he was pretty inf- influential in the fourth century. He said, prayer is the laying aside of thoughts. Do you ever think that? Prayer is actually the laying aside of thoughts? Well, isn't prayer like thinking the right thoughts or at the right time? What if we looked at prayer something different as a time, and you might know what's going on right here. Um, Prayer is a time where you set aside to pray for people, to intercede, to, to pray for yourself, to pray for your family, to pray for your church, but it's more than that. God's presence, if you don't remember anything today, if you don't remember, and you probably won't, but if, if you remember one thing today, Remember that God is always available for you, always. God's presence is always here. And so this little metaphor, which breaks down a little bit, is, the, is like the invitation to remember that we can sit down and connect with, with God who is always present to us. And so in our regular prayer time, we Set aside some time to pray with God, to talk with God, converse with God. But all day long, the presence, the real presence, capital R, capital P, that we're going to celebrate here is available. And kind of the journey of prayer without words is learning to rest in God's presence. Be present in the moment. To go into your inner room. I want to get back to the scripture just for, another, just for a minute. So Jesus tells them, uh, go into your inner room and pray to the Lord your, se- Lord your God in secret. He's talking to the disciples, right? Who are what? Don't have a home. Don't have a regular home. Go into your inner room. Where is he telling them to go? In what inner room are they talking about? And so some of the early uh, church fathers and mothers believe that they were talking about going inside your heart going below the motion faculties of your mind, your will, your intellect, your imagination, your memory, and resting in God who already knows what you need. And so prayer, there's a lot of different ways to pray. And setting 
aside some regular time is an important part, but there's also that prayer without words that you can cultivate and connect with the real presence in the moment. But we spend most of our time where? In the past, thinking about things, replaying stuff over and over again, or in the future, right? And if we're stuck in the past or stuck in the future, we can't, it's kind of hard to be present in the now. So cultivating a prayer practice really helps us do that, to be really centered in the moment. I'm jumping all over the place. The other thing that when McGray and I were talking about this sermon we talked about is a good spart- starting point isn't necessary to look at the how, but to look at the who. To look at the ha- not to look at the how, but to look at the who. Because how you view God will determine the way you pray to God. How you view God will determine how you pray to God. Let me first give you an example. Richard Rohr, who some of you know is one of my favorite kind of modern day mystics, says that if you boil it all down, people have kind of three views of God. The first is God is angry. God is angry. I had this view of God early in my um, 20s where I was scared to God. I was scared to talk to God. I thought God was going to get me. What I realized is that I wasn't punished for my sins. I was punished by them. I wasn't punished for my sins. I was punished by them. And so I thought this, this God was, you know, I was scared. And so if you have an angry view of God, that'll affect how you pray. The second and I find this is pretty prevalent even among people that come to worship indifference. If God is indifferent. It's the Jeffersonian God. Thomas Jefferson believed that God made creation and then he was hands off. Indifferent. Not personal. Absolutely. Not personal. That God doesn't care. I met with a church Remember a number of years ago, we sat down and talking, and he was going through a firestorm in his life, just craziness. And I said, hey, how are you including God in that? And he said, I'm not. God's got better things to do than to worry about me. He had a view that God was indifferent to him. So that's the second. The last one is that God is benevolent. God is more for you and more for us and more for the world and all creation than we are for ourselves. And that, if you believe that, if you've experienced that in some way, shape, or form, if you've experienced the grace of Jesus Christ, that there's nothing you can do to get in, in, in his right, there's no action or behavior or no being good or no moral morality that gets you right with God, but if you can actually experience the love and grace of Jesus, and you can experience how benevolent he is towards you and to your family and towards this broken world, it will change how you pray. You will remember that God is always available to you, to us, even when we can't feel it. Because sometimes in prayer, we want to feel something, right? It's almost like uh, St. John of the Cross said, the beginning of faith begins when you start, when you stop feeling God. What? The beginning of faith begins when you stop having the good feelings of God because you begin to do it not just for the feelings, but because you've experienced the grace and love of Jesus. So, Steve Harper in the book, Five Marks of the Methodist, if you haven't got it, there's a couple weeks left. I suggest you do. It's, it's short and it's really good. It's powerful. And one of the things that he says in that is once you experience God as benevolent, he uses different words, your prayer life transitions from something like regulation to relationship. It moves from regulation to relationship. And then the second thing um, that it does is it moves from the impersonal to the personal. I remember when I met Caroline. So this was back in 98, so I didn't get to see what she looked like before I met her. It was my first and only blind date. So all the young people are like, you didn't know what she looked like when you saw her? There was no Facebook, no, there's none of that. So 
So she opened the door, and for those of you who know my wife, she's just radiant and smiley, and she's got these like sparkly eyes, right? And so I, she opened the door, and I was like, yeah. <laughs> I didn't do that. It also helped that my dog was fat, and she was the only uh, girl that I had dated that came and said, oh, this dog is so well-fed. I thought, I got a winner here. So anyway, the reason I tell you that story is that she was a stranger, right? I didn't know who she was, and she showed up at the door, and like, I, I like wanted to get to know her. We were acquaintances. We started to share with one another. We started to share our lives a little bit. We want, I wanted to connect with her. And so the prayer, prayer life in deepening a relationship moves from like acquaintance, stranger, acquaintance, good friend, intimate lover. Now, of course, I won't say anything more about that, but this road in our prayer life is to move from acquaintance to intimate friend or lover. And setting aside time regularly has us connect with God. So that's why we do it. It's hard to learn to live in the presence of God if you don't set any time aside. So if I met Caroline and like experienced this, wow, you know, experienced God's love and grace or Caroline's love and grace, and then I never sat down and spent any time with her, would that relationship really grow and develop? No. And so that's the... That's the invitation for us in our prayer lives is to begin to look at different types of prayer, different forms of prayer. I got up at 4.45 this morning to do 20 minutes of silent prayer. That's, that's my style. It doesn't have to be your style. It's a way for me to center on God in the present moment. It's called contemplation, silence. Most people don't think Christians meditate, but we do. And there's a way to live it and that centers us in the, in the, in the moment. So, I've really blown the uh, media guys out of the water because I'm not following this, sorry. Can you put up the, uh, the connect slide? You may have already done it, but okay. So, this is what prayer does. It allows us to communicate with God and allowed God to communicate with us. It connects us to God on a regular basis, and then it unites us to God. And the, in, in the uniting or the union or the communion that Steve T Harper talks about in his book is something that we have to build. It's like a muscle almost because our mind just goes all day long, right? Oh, God's there. You can come back anytime you want. And you know what? God's not gonna be angry. God's not gonna be indifferent. But what God is going to be is benevolent, benevolent towards you, to support you in your difficult times, to be joyful in your exuberant times, and also cultivate that reliance upon God rather than self-sufficiency. We are taught in a million different ways to be self-sufficient, and Jesus invites us to be God sufficient. So, here's my challenge for, for y'all this week. If you have a regular prayer time, awesome. Continue it. Continue to do it. If you don't, I invite you to find a time of day that works for you and just set aside a little bit of time and talk to God like you're talking to Caroline. No, don't talk to Caroline. Whoever's important in your life. Just kidding. Talk to somebody that's important in your life and set that aside. Now, if you have a regular prayer life, I want to invite you into centering yourself in the moment where the real presence is most available to us. And so we're going to do that together right now as our ending time. So I'm going to give, let's do 30 seconds together. And what I want you to do is just focus your whole being in the moment. If you start thinking about stuff, just go back and focus on your breath or focus on a word. The word I use is Abba. You can use whatever word you want. But we're going to do that together. Let's do it together. Ready? 
go. God, move us from ashes to action. May we remember that you are there, benevolent, waiting for us. May we pray constantly and unite with you. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.